Chat GPT and generative AI have spawned a level of mass excitement in technology last seen many years ago, maybe when smartphones became a mass phenomenon, maybe. Uh, almost everybody is trying to figure out what newer things they can get these generative AI models to do. And the possibilities look enormous. The world definitely looks to be at an inflection point with artificial intelligence, but that's also becoming a cause for big worry. The technology is literally in the hands of everyone and it's becoming so easy to use that there are serious concerns around ethics, privacy, risks, and responsibilities that are rapidly emerging. As NASCOM says, it's critical to discuss how to worry wisely with AI. What are the necessary guardrails to ensure that AI innovation is aligned with societal well-being and to minimize potential risks associated with its development and deployment? That's what we will discuss today. So welcome to this Times Techies webinar. I'm Sujit John, and I have with me my colleague Shilpa Fadnis. The two of us will moderate the discussion. We have a highly distinguished panel this afternoon. We have Devjani Ghosh. Devjani is the president of the IT industry body, NASCOM. She has been on this platform several times before. NASCOM, as all of you know, is an association that has played a singular role in bringing India's IT industry to where it is today. Devjani has been president of NASCOM since April 2018. Prior to NASCOM, Devjani was with Intel for over 10 years in different roles, the last of which was as MD of India. Welcome, Devjani. We have with us Rohini Srivatsa. Rohini too has been on this platform before. Rohini is National Technology Officer at Microsoft's India Operations. She's responsible for leading strategic initiatives to accelerate digital transformation across industries and government. Rohini began her career in R&D at at and Bell Laboratories in the US. Prior to joining Microsoft, she was in strategy consulting at the Boston Consulting Group and IBM Global Business Services. Welcome, Rohini. We have Akhilesh Suteja. Akhilesh is partner at KPMG in India. He's also the global cybersecurity leader, national alliances, and TMT industry leader at KPMG in India. Akhilesh has been with KPMG for over 25 years. He has advised over 200 clients in matters relating to cybersecurity, IT strategy, selection of technologies, and help them realize the business benefits of technology. Welcome, Akhilesh. Thank you for having me. And we have with us Professor Balraman Ravindran. Professor Ravindran has been on this platform before. He heads the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI at IIT Madras, a leading interdisciplinary AI research center in India. He is also the Mindtree Faculty Fellow and Professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Madras. Currently, his research interests are centered on learning from and through interactions and span the areas of geometric deep learning and reinforcement learning. Welcome, Professor Ravindran. Those of you who this can send in questions through the Facebook comment box. Sujit and I will put them to Dave Jani, oh. Rohit, Professor Balraman, and Akhilesh. Yeah. Dave Jani, coming to you first, uh, why don't you help us set the context, give us a sense of opportunities around AI, and what is it that worries you today about this rapid progress in AI? Thanks, Shilpa. So, you know, first, let me put in perspective this thing called rapid progress that we talk, all talk about, right? I mean, the pace at which uh, we are seeing AI, especially generative AI advance, and more importantly, the space at which companies are releasing products and then the compounding effect that it has is something that we have honestly never dealt with. And this is really pushing, uh, uh, you know, the laws of exponential growth to, to its, to its ultra, testing it to its ultimate limits. Um, I mean, just to put, if, put it in perspective, a few numbers, um, you know, when chat GPT got launched, everyone knows it gained its first million users in just five days absolutely unheard of. It launched in November of last year. And then it reached its 100 million user marks in two months after the launch. This is the fastest we have ever seen for any consumer internet app till now. By comparison, just you know, some of the other fast growing apps, TikTok, nine months um, after its global launch to reach, reach 100 million. Instagram, um, I think more than two years um, around that time, around two years is what it took. Uh, 
So it's just been fantastic. And what is happening is every day there's a new surprise. The last few weeks has all been about auto GPT. It's almost like chat GPT has become old, but it, you know, it's just a few months old. But the way the community is, is getting engaged and talking about it. And, and what is fascinating about uh, auto GPT is that uh, it pretty much can perform a task with very little humor inter intervention. You know, chat GPT is all about prompts and everyone's talking about how the most uh, important engineering field, if it can be called that, is prompt engineering. And here is auto GPT, which is just make, you know, saying that uh, human prompts or human intervention in prompts is no more needed. So the scale at which the innovation is happening, the scale at which actual products, platforms are getting created. That's what's mind boggling. And I think what the, the concerns that it raises and very valid concerns, like innovation is a must. It must happen and it must happen unfettered. I honestly and firmly believe in that. But the pace of innovation today is something that we are not used to. And we are grappling as an industry to figure out, we, we're grappling with the problem to figure out how do you ensure that the pace of innovation and the pace of alignment of that innovation with human values stays aligned, it grows together. We sh the pace of innovation cannot be at a completely different trajectory than the pace of alignment. And I'll pause here, but I think that's the biggest concern that we have to answer. Um, in my mind, the answer is not stopping innovation. The answer is significantly amping the urgency, the focus on investment so that we can uh, on alignment so that we can catch up. Okay, we'll uh, go into that alignment part a little later. But uh, Rohini, give us an idea. You, you are one of, uh, now Microsoft is today one of the biggest investors in OpenAI, which came out with ChatGPT. Uh, give us a sense of the kind of uses uh, that ChatGPT and generative AI is being put to. So just building, absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, so look, uh, you know, AI is not new. And what we are seeing today, the, the huge difference in, uh, in the type of um, uh, adopt adaptation that happened on, uh, on AI with chat GPT is really think about the user interface, right? The user interface really created that access to AI that earlier was perhaps hidden behind because we are all using AI in multiple uh, forums and multiple applications in every day. Now, having said that, uh, clearly the uh, the world we are in is a different world. It's a completely different paradigm. Um, and uh, and to and to echo Devdani's point, the kind of pace of ex uh, of experimentation and exploration that that we are seeing is is truly mind boggling. And in fact, if anything, it is the the type of use cases are only increasing, and uh, people's ability to think and come and do this combinatorial implementation, combinatorial uh, uh, type of exploration is also increasing. So I think the 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 use cases are across the board, whether you look at from text perspective, uh, from summarization to really being able to talk to your data, to, uh, to uh, uh, the marketing, it's, it's really across the board, right? I mean, if you're looking at, for example, um, some of the co-pilot uh, type of uh, announcements that Microsoft has made, uh, it's, um, it's opening up a whole different way of thinking about AI. And I like to use a sort of a little bit of a play on words called augmented intelligence. Because in many ways, you can now think about any role, any function, uh, any industry. Uh, you have an ability to uh, to have this co-pilot, this this uh, this uh, this uh, agent who is really being able to be your intelligent. Uh, uh, companion, so to speak, right? Uh, so think about, let's say you are looking at uh, this meeting we are having, and let's say for some reason you're not able to attend this meeting, uh, you can later on uh, question an agent to say what happened in this meeting. You know, who said what? Uh, was, was there any action item for me? And you can have the conversation with that agent, right? Uh, which is truly uh, game changing. And you can think about that kind of application across the board, uh, you know, healthcare, education, etc. right? But I'll pause there. I think the important point I want to pause after this is to say that the whole idea of alignment 
Um, and I like the word alignment, actually, it's a really good um, uh, uh, term, um, is something that uh, many of us have been working on for several years. Um, right. I mean, uh, NASCOM began, was working on this last year and had come out with a toolkit. Before that, Niti Aayog had put forth uh, the responsibility AI principles as well as what will it take to operationalize. From Microsoft's side, we've been on this journey since 2016. Uh, and it's been a long journey and we have learned a lot along the way, put forward a lot along the way. So it is not something that we sort of say, okay, suddenly we are looking at this whole alignment issue. It is it is a learning journey in progress. It goes from principles to what does it take to put those principles to practice through policies, through governance, through tools. So it's a, it's a, it's a journey that we will have to, all of us have to accelerate getting on top of and taking it very, very seriously. Let me pause with that. So you, a lot of your developers are using this co-pilot kind of thing to do their codes as well? So look, I, I think the, the way I would put it is uh, two things I would respond to, right? One is um, Microsoft as a platform company, we developers outside <laughs> build on Microsoft platform, right? So if somebody is using, for example, an enterprise customer who's using GitHub Copilot as a subscription, then they are developing using GitHub Copilot in their subscription. Now, internally, Microsoft, of course, as a developer community, I'm sure we are experimenting. But the important thing I want to pause with that, the responsible AI standard, we actually launched the version one in 2019. Uh, the, the second version was launched after two years in 2021, after we have we had learned from two years of rolling it out across the organization, across uh, thousands of developer communities and products to see what does it take to go from principles to put these principles into practice in a company of our scale and size and scope. So in 2021, the version two of the standard came out, which brings, which brings standards, principles into what are the goals and what does it take to then define requirements and what are the tools and techniques required to then fulfill those requirements. So there's been a lot of journey and the responsibility as standard is what our developers and our engineering groups are working with and adhering to and aligning to as we work in this space. So 2021, as I said, is the version two was published. And last year, the standard, as well as many of the artifacts of the responsibility AI standard are now public for others to use, to provide feedback on, to, to help us all learn together. I, I know this is a slightly technical point, but uh, Devjani mentioned it, but can, can you explain that a uh, little uh, prompt itself being automated? What does that mean? Ah, okay. So the, the word prompt has become, uh, and it's, it's a good it's a technical question. The word prompt is the input a user gives to a large language model that then becomes the model's input to provide its output. But at the end of the day, it is a predictive machine. Um, so the prompt becomes the input. Now, what Devjani was talking about is that is there a way in which the prompt itself can be automated, right? Um, and, and some of that is happening and that is definitely uh, puts in, kicks in a whole different type of, of innovation, uh, but that's what in summary it means. If, I, if I'm a human and I'm able to say, I would like to go to a restaurant, uh, you know, in, in, in Martha Halli, uh, and then if I need to be able to go there and I, I can say, I just want to have dinner there and the required prompts to get there, somebody else is able to provide, that's what the difference is between a prompt versus something that actually creates the prompt itself. Okay, okay. Akhilesh, tell me, I mean, you work with a number of companies. Uh, what, enormous excitement among them? They're all trying to experiment with um, generative AI? I have never seen the CEO communities being more excited about any <laughs> technology than this one. Uh, because as uh, I think uh, we heard before that uh, not only it's a brand new technology, I think it's uh, the UI of the technology which has made it easier. So many CEOs wouldn't have been able to experiment uh, with the large scale AI they deployed in their enterprises even earlier, but now I can do it on my phone. And when I can do it myself, then I get excited. So it's one of those saying, you know, yeah, everybody has a toy and how do I make that toy make money uh, for the company? So there is a huge amount of excitement in um, all the all, all my clients. Uh, definitely uh, many of them are uh, doing proof of concept, many of them are trying to think about what it could mean. And also many of them actually mean that what it changes for their business. Because uh, for example, if you're 
research company, uh, you also start to think that, you know, if a large part of the work which is done by, you know, uh, an augmented uh, intelligence, then how should my business model change? So yes, there is a huge amount of excitement. Uh, I would say 90% uh, positive and optimistic, and then some saying, so what does it change to our business? Some use cases that are emerging, I mean, what, what are they experimenting with most? So the easiest ones, again, there's a, there's a range of use cases being tried. The easiest one are uh, relating to customer service which is, uh, I think all of us have been the victim of some dumb uh, chatbots when you're trying to do either uh, an airline service or a banking service or an insurance and all that. And you hit, you, you meet a chatbot and say, you know, wish I was speaking to a human. So uh, I think most companies have, uh, who've implemented uh, what I would call the primitive chatbots are now starting to do uh, some of these kinds of things. By the way, before I say all the use cases, I do want to say it's not easy for an enterprise to pick up a chat GPT and plug it into their system. I think there's a whole lot of uh, mechanics which goes before a large language model can actually be used and trained and all of that. But I think the uh, conceptual use cases and also some experimental POC. So one is uh, the, the clearly in the area of uh, uh, customer service. The other one which is coming on what I'd call the uh, documentation services. So when you have to summarize some inputs, when you have to create a brief, when you have to even articulate something, uh, Third one is uh, research augmentation. That's another uh, big area which is coming. Fourth what is one, that? Yeah. What is research augmentation? Uh, which basically says that, you know, so today, uh, let, let's take the example of uh, Times Techies. And, you know, you, you are writing and you decide to have uh, a piece on saying what could the cloud services in India look like? And before Shilpa, you go up to your questions to an AWS and Azure, you want to say, okay, do my questions look like a universal set of things which I should be talking about based on the current trends? You put it to a large language model, it'll pick up saying, you know, what's their coverage? Is your coverage good? Or you should also be adding these three things. So it's not replacing your research, but I think it's augmenting your research to start with. That's the input research augmentation. And then there's an output research augmentation, which works in a similar way to say, are there you know, outliers? boundary conditions which one has missed so uh, I, I could talk because all my clients are now are uh, experimenting with this I could tell you there are about 20 plus use cases with which we are personally working with our clients uh, creating some thought process and also talking about uh, why we shouldn't kind of uh, be overly optimistic because there are also implications on how easy difficult and uh, practical some of those things are because uh, let's let's if I were to just stick to this chat GPT particularly again just kind of looking at this particular model uh, it's a it's a language model so it's not uh, a fully and uh, you know reasoning rational all of that model what it basically says that you know I can predict what is the next word based on the past words I've heard so it's a kind of statistical model to predict the next word and therefore many a times uh, people who are applying to it to do let's say uh, you know, uh, fact-based questioning uh, may not be the right thing. If you are trying to do puzzle solving, which the puzzles haven't been solved, not a right thing to do. If you are trying to uh, put it to say that, you know, could it create a, a new strategy which didn't exist for me? And there are many, many things which a large language model is not designed to do it. So I think in my view, uh, the biggest uh, education I'm doing with my clients is to actually tell that what this uh, new tool can do and can do in a phenomenally great way but don't think of it as a one size fits all and try and do some funny things which will give you disappointing outcomes. Okay, it does not work for everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, professor, what you must be the most popular professor in IIT uh, right now. Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, already we were hearing about AI classes or everybody coming for AI electives and all of that. Now, what huge numbers, uh, everybody wanting to learn AI and what? So one, yeah, one thing you should realize that ChatGPT has been around since December, right? And there's not been enough time for students to enroll in classes. So I'll probably see the impact next semester, right? So, so that's so everybody. I mean, in fact, there was somebody actually from Times who kept asking me, "How are you dealing with all these students who are, you know, using ChatGPT to answer their question papers?" I said, "No, that's not really happened." So academia works on a slightly slower time scale than the industry. So that really hasn't changed, right? But having said that, I'm becoming popular outside IIT also. So a lot of people are actually inviting me to come and talk about, you know, chat GPT, can you explain to us what is this technology, what are the implications and so on and so forth. So that is happening and I have been giving these talks. In fact, I was invited in December to give a talk in February about chat GPT. And by the time I went to the talk, GPT-4 had already come and chat GPT was old news. And, and in fact, I gave the talk just roughly about 
about 100, uh, about 200 days after ChatGPT had come, right? And when I told people in the audience that it's only 200 days since ChatGPT was come, a lot of people are actually surprised. They thought they have been hearing about this technology for so long that it must have been around for a longer time. And people are asking me, oh, have, have they developed chat GPT tools for you know, substituting my auditor, right? And there's one person in the audience asking me, is, should we even be thinking about studying for CA? You know? So it's chartered accountancy, is that going to be a, a, a thing in the future? So I told them, if you use chat GPT for your accounting, then uh, it'll be, you'll get a new definition of uh, you know, creative accounting. Because ChatGPT is going to make <laughs> hallucinate transactions yeah. that they have not made before. So, I mean, the, the excitement is there, right? Not just among the CEO community, but uh, uh, as Akhilesh was saying, but among even the common uh, people, right? In fact, I had students ranging from ninth standard kids all the way to uh, people who were like 70 year old attending some of my public talks on ChatGPT. So, it's amazing the kind of excitement, kind of uh, how much it has cap captured the popular imagination. Right? And uh, so a lot of education is needed because uh, uh, like Eclair was rightly pointing out, it's not a one solution fits all. Right? And there are so many things that can go wrong. In fact, uh, 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 the biggest challenge for me, with especially when my students start using ChatGPT for doing research, is that when ChatGPT quote unquote hallucinates, output, right? It's doing it in such a nice, self-consistent manner, right? Unless I take recourse to a non-LLM search engine like Google, I won't even be able to say that something has gone wrong. I can't look at, you know, usually when my students are making up stuff, I can look at self-consistency and then say, hey, no, this guy is actually, you know, making things up. But I can't do that with ChatGPT or, or GPT-4. ChatGPT is still, there are problems with it. But GPT-4 is almost impossible to say when, when it's saying something that's wrong, right? Uh, and so with just so looking at this. are becoming very creative. They are cooking things up literally and you're making you believe that's true. Uh, so let's not attribute human qualities to these models yet, okay? <laughs> so they don't have agency, right? They don't have, uh, you know, independent motivation or anything like that. So, so I would to say that the models are becoming creative or they're trying to make you believe something uh, is, is going down a very dangerous path for me, right? And I don't think we should do that. I, I think it should still understand that they are still, uh, you know, uh, statistical models at the end of the day. And whatever is it that you feel as intelligent behavior is emergent uh, just by looking at uh, uh, large volumes of data and getting the statistics out of it. And there is no way that, um, uh, you know, these systems are doing any kind of deliberative uh, uh, planning or design in order to come up with uh, outputs that are trying to fool you, right? So that's something, that's a very major distinction. They're able to they create false, answers in response to what you give. That is because of the way the math works out, not because they are trying to cheat you or trying to fool you. Using language like that is it's actually pretty worrisome for me because I have lived through one AI winter. I'm in no rush to see another one, so. Okay, so so there are concerns. So, okay, Devjani, coming back to you, I mean, all these concerns that Professor Ravindran raised, of course, everybody is also talking about those concerns. Um, I mean, there are ethical issues, there are uh, privacy issues, all of that. Uh, give us an idea. What kind of guardrails can we put? What what should governments do? Does the world need to come together? Can India play a role here? I think, Professor, I want to touch on something that Professor Ravindran just said, which is so, so important to this conversation, which is let's stop giving human attributes to the technology. Um, and I think in our um, excitement in, you know, we are, all of us are learning. No one today knows all the answers. All of us are learning. Every day we are learning. But in our e excitement, we sort of, uh, uh, you know, get get very passionate about this tool and almost start referring it to it, to, to it as a human. And honestly, uh, that's the one thing that worries me the most. Frankly, if you're talking about concerns, that behavior of humans is what worries me tremendously. Um, second, I want to build on something Rohini said, and which is again, so important to understand. Uh, we have to come to terms with what it does and what it doesn't do. And what it does is it's, it helps us augment our own productivity. I'm, I'm a very avid user. 
And I have found that it has especially given that I write a lot. I have found that it augments my ability to do research and improve my writing more than 10x, I would say, right? So it is, it is about really understanding what it does. It does not write, I mean, it, it can, but they're not as good. It, if I can't tell it, write an article for me or write copy Akhilesh's last two articles and churn out something for me. I'm sure it could do that if I prompted it, right? But that's not what I want. And I think as humans, we also have to be very clear about uh, what we want and what we do not want. And we're talking about concerns and we're talking about responsible use and ethics. And someone said, I forget who, but I love this statement, that if you want to see responsible AI, look for responsible humans. Because ultimately, it is our responsibility. It is on us in terms of how we build the technology, how we use it, and what are the guardrails. So now comes to the talk about regulation. And I'm not the expert by far, but just learning from the industry, watching all of this play out. I honestly believe we are not at a stage where we even know what to regulate and how to regulate. And if by going into it, we are going to see knee-jerk reactions like we have done in a few countries. Um, it's too early in the game. It's too early in the day where we have to actually see how it plays out a bit. Where, you know, wh how does it really impact lives, jobs, et cetera, et cetera, all the concerns we are talking about. Now, while we do that, I do not believe we can sit back and wait for it to just play out. I think what's, there are two things that's important. As industry, I think we need to come out, and most companies already are coming out with their own guiding principles. As NASCOM, what we have decided is we'll work with the industry and come out with a common set of framework or governing principles, uh, which as an industry, we can stand by to say, this is how we look at building responsible tech. It's not, a, it's not a mandate or a code of conduct, but it's a framework to help guide us, to ask the right questions. Roini talked about the responsible AI framework NASCOM had created with industry. That's what it does, because this is not something, a question that you suddenly ask at the day of your, the launch of your product. This, these are questions that you ask from the time you come out with the idea to design it, to develop it, to commercialize it, the entire life cycle. So at each stage, what questions should we be asking? What are those checks we should have in place to ensure it's inclusive, to ensure as much as possible it's transparent and accountable, to ensure that it is keeping human interest first, right? These are some of the basic principles that we are putting in place and building, working with industry, working with the NASCOM Executive Council to build out what should be the questions that needs to get asked at each of these stages. And then making sure that industry as a whole, or at least the tech industry in India, has access to this framework has access to each other's learnings, what works, what doesn't work, where do, where do you really face a challenge, how do you overcome the challenge, and create that community of collective learning, because Sujit, that is what is needed more than anything else today, right? That is how we will figure this thing out, slow but sure. And as we do that, we're also, starting the dialogue with government, because government is, I mean, not just Indian government, but global government, there is a lot of talk of regulation. A lot of countries are jumping into it. You have to realize that in today's world, the tech industry is truly global. You cannot stop something anymore. If you stop it in one country, it'll just, that work will move to another country. And one country's regulation will become another country's competitive advantage, right? So you have to be really careful about, first of all, what you regulate and how you regulate, and this needs time. And again, I think no one, be it in industry or government, has all these answers. And what we are proposing is let's let's set up a multidisciplinary task force 
that gets into looking at all of these things. And before jumping into regulation, maybe even comes out with what are the design principles for regulating tech? For example, I don't know if it makes sense to regulate research. You have to re let research happen a bit unfettered is my personal view, but I'm again, Professor Ravindran might have a point of view there. Uh, but, but I feel that if you regulate research too much, you're gonna limit its scope. You're gonna, you're gonna put a stop before you know what can happen you're going to define the answers and just just doesn't make sense to me but you should absolutely absolutely regulate the products that get commercialized or built out of the research to ensure that as you come as a company commercializes the research they don't commercialize it to create harm and how do you regulate that and certain industries like pharma etc have done it to some extent right so what should be those design principles it's very very important you don't regulate technology but you should regulate usage cases based on risk and another thing we are proposing to government is given that india has the g20 lead this year i think it's a fantastic opportunity for our government to take this dialogue to the G20 countries and try and get at least some broad alignment between the G20 countries on these design principles. Now, I know, it, I know it's a bit naive and I know it's gonna be almost impossible to get, to get countries to align, but the conversations can start. We can figure out what are the points of disagreement, you know, and I think it's so important for these conversations to start. They've done is made multiple very important points there. Uh, the roles of companies, countries, uh, where reg what should be regulated, what should not be. Uh, Rohini, uh, Akhilesh, Professor Ravindran, uh, please go ahead, jump in. I mean, where, where do you think? Yeah, yeah, Professor Ravindran, you want to make a point. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of things that I wanted to follow up on what uh, Deitani said. So the first thing is about coming up with these guidelines and principles. I think that's absolutely important, right? But what I'm seeing, I've been looking at, so uh, uh, I've been looking at this whole idea of responsible AI for a while now. And if you look at all the regulations, right? I feel that there's a gap between coming up with these principles that you would like to adhere to and what it means on the ground when you are actually translating that into technologies, right? That is still a gap. I mean, I mean, large organizations like Microsoft are well posed to fill the gap, but uh, you know, outside of that, right? uh, it's that's a challenge. And and I do believe some amount of even academic. Research What's the challenge, Professor? What's the challenge? So so for example, I'll tell you something like uh, you have to make sure that your large language model does not generate any derogatory language towards a particular section, right? So you have to have something like fairness. Right, in the terms of uh, you know uh, language generation and things like that. Right, suppose I'm building something for Indian languages, or or even looking at the Indian context. I can generate text in English, but in looking at the Indian context, do I even know what constitutes as derogatory language, say in in Bihar? Right, do I even have that written down somewhere for me to actually say that I have to enforce that into my system? No. Right. So when you, you can have these kinds of very high level principles, but when you're actually going down to codifying that into technology, I think there's still a big gap, not just, I mean, it's just an example I pulled off the top of my head, uh, but I have a presentation where I have a whole bunch of these, uh, these kinds of examples that are out there, right? So that is a lot of work that needs to be done and not just, I mean, people are running, and companies are running to get the deployment out, right? I mean, uh, they don't really want these kinds of research to be in the critical path to product development. So there has to be more collaboration between industry, academia, and all that, right? Uh, and uh, so we need to work on, I mean, I, I like to uh, Mr. BS, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, the name, but yeah, it's a human construct, right? So, the, but the humans have to come in. So he's, he was talking about derogatory language being a human construct. Yes, it is. But when you're talking about responsible AI, you have to, this is the whole problem of alignment, both uh, Devjani and Rohini talked about earlier. You have to make sure you align yourself with human values uh, in order to get these outputs. So it's it's very, very important. So that is, that is uh, that's the first part of it. The second part of it was, I want to agree with what Rohini said about not regulating research, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, what Devjani said about not regulating research and but regulating uh, uh, applications products. of these uh, products, right? And uh, I completely agree with that, but there's also a counter to that, which I have heard made. So I'm just putting it out there for discussion. So if you don't regulate research, see, once somebody invents it, 
that somebody is going to productize it. Okay, so should we stop it at the invention stage so that uh, you know really you know uh, bad technology doesn't get invented? So I, I mean that's a debatable issue, but I think uh, uh, you know research shouldn't get regulated. And there's also this question. In fact, I was having this uh, discussion with somebody just the other day about whether it was right for chat GPT to come out at this stage when the technology is not quite ready, right? I mean, the guardrails are not in place. Is it, was it fine? What's the right thing to do? So I think, yes, right? So we need uh, uh, things like chat GPT or BARD or uh, whatever it is need to come out uh, because only when people start interacting with it, we are seeing all the all the nuances and what are the various ways and people are going to use it, misuse it. And, and, and the need for all the regulations that are coming up. So I just wanted to put this out. So we are starting a center for responsible AI at IIT Midras, and we are actually setting this up, hopefully setting this up as a consortium model with more participation from uh, the industry and, and also from other uh, academic institutions. So, uh, so that's something that we, we really look to look, uh, explore all these issues uh, uh, through the center for responsible. I know a lot of hands have come up, so I'll stop. And let's, uh, yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, Rohini talk. very interesting. Rohini, go, go ahead. So uh, very interesting points. I want to just, uh, you know, respond to a couple of things. Uh, so, you know, we have to understand uh, and, and each of these things takes a little effort. We have to understand that chat GPT is a chat interface to a large language model. It's not a search engine. <laughs> okay, You have to be very clear about it. Yeah. It's not a search engine. Um, now, when you say, Bing, it's a search engine. Bing chat is a search engine that uses the large language model underneath it, but it grounds it to reality by using search. Even there, it tells you, tell me how creative you want me to be. So I want us to be clear. You know, we are using chat GPT very interchangeably uh, as if it's, a, it's not a search engine. Let's just realize that, right? So having put that aside, let me come to some of the points that Devjani was making and also Professor Ravindran was making. Yes, it is very difficult to go from just say principles, I've got something fairness. What does it mean? Right? And when I have sat with, um, with customers and partners in their context, let's think, of, for, for example, let's say an insurance provider, right? What does fairness mean in your context? It has, it has made everybody in the room Think about what do these values mean for them? And that is a very important discussion to first have because it makes, makes us look at the mirror and say, what does fairness mean to you, right? Uh, so the importance of these principles in the context of Indian culture is absolutely important. That point is taken, but we need to go further because principles, if you give to a product designer, the product designer is saying, give me requirements. Tell me what I should adhere to. What should I do, right? Which is why when I was talking about how our two-year journey from the version one of the standard, which came out in 2019, to version two that came out in 2021, was going through this entire exercises when we were telling our engineering folks, look, here's the standard. Please adopt it. They were like, no, tell me more. What do I really do? What are my requirements, right? So therefore, it required for each of these six principles, Microsoft has six principles, to be converted from there to goals. So each of these principles has a goal. So there are 17 goals for each of these principles. The goals then go into requirements. Now I'm talking the language of a product manager, okay? Whether it's product or in functional requirements or non-functional requirements. Now I've got responsibility and now it's got requirements. But you tell a product manager, okay, these are requirements. And you're like, how do I meet them? That then leaves into tools and techniques and processes to be able to meet those requirements. And that is the journey we went through. To say just take principles and put them to practice doesn't mean anything. It means putting the principles into what are the goals. And that was a real aha moment for us to say, what are the goals I'm trying to achieve? And it has to be very specific for each principle. If you call going to call fairness a principle or transparency, whatever the principle might be, what are the goals and then what are the requirements? And it is therefore not, in, in fact, I would say it doesn't even end into tools and techniques to meet those requirements because tools and techniques are a very ongoing area of research in responsible AI and it's a very vibrant community of people working on the alignment area of research. It needs more people, but fine. 
it needs policies, it needs practices, it needs governance. So it is not just you can throw a tool at it. So it is a fairly um, nuanced and, a, and to be very honest, a very humbling experience, <laughs> right? Because even after going through this journey, don't have all the answers. And it's a constant, uh, you know, uh, um, having a growth mind to mindset to say, okay, we are, this is something we learned. And the last point I would say is there are instances where we have learned that this particular technology, and I'll give an example, that, for example, facial recognition, its ability to tell what the emotions are on a page, we realized it's actually, it, it doesn't even understand what emotions mean. So we have taken that API off. You can no longer use Azure API to detect emotions because we realized fundamentally, what does it even mean to across different races, Asians versus Africans versus, what does it mean to show a face that is showing anger? It is not a universal principle. Really? That's very yes. interesting. Okay. Yes. So, that, so we are being in this process of really self-regulating or self-understanding. No, this is not ready to be used by an open API. So we've taken it off. What about drivers sleeping and all that? Uh, auto companies say they are watching drivers and stuff like that. You have to build in the right. So what I'm trying to say is that our ability to say that, you know, take something as a face API and apply it to just get emotions directly off of Azure. We don't think it's, we don't, it's we don't yeah. believe it it's, is it's, it's, Now you build on top of it some checks and balances to be able to say what you will do. How will you make sure there's a human in the loop, et cetera. That's a different question. But all I'm saying is that this is not a slam. This is, this is the learning journey for all of us. Okay. I, I just want to quickly say, so it's sleep is still not an emotion. It's fine. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I said sleep is still not an emotion. It's okay to direct. Uh, okay, it. sleep is not an emotion. Sure. <laughs> yes. Akhilesh, go ahead. Uh, Akhilesh, you're muted. Um, can't hear Akhilesh. Akhilesh is muted. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I could hear him clearly. Oh, okay. We right. can well, hear him. Yeah, go, go ahead, Akhilesh. Yeah. So Sujit has developed selective hearings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I was saying that, you know, it's always hard to come after uh, lawyers, but uh, after two at PhD doctors, it's even harder. So, but I'll still uh, try to kind of uh, nuance some of this. So first of all, I don't disagree with uh, most of the things which are being spoken. So I think there is a good amount of alignment, if I would use that word here. Uh, I would just uh, maybe try and bring some uh, things to light based on what I think we've been talking about here. So one of the topic which kind of came for debate and professor put it saying that, you know, should research be uh, regulated or not and all of that. Uh, I would uh, avoid research versus development versus deployment, but to say that, you know, uh, the fundamental technology versus applied technology. So fundamental technology versus applied use cases. Uh, I think in my view, the concept of uh, controlling the fundamental technology development will definitely be slowing down uh, the, the humanity's progress. And we have seen many, many, many cases where uh, a technology which uh, has actually done wonders sometimes can mis be misused. That doesn't mean that we stop uh, developing and building new technology. So classical example is that if, you, if I were to ask you saying, you know, uh, what is causing the biggest uh, cyber crime in the world today? It's ransomware. And how does ransomware actually come to play? It's because there is an encryption technology. So somebody built in a technology saying that if I lock, only I can open. It's a one-way encryption. But imagine for that reason, we stopped developing one-way encryption. There would be no internet. There would be no internet banking. There would be no commerce. There would be no... So just the fact that uh, an encryption technology can be used by bad actors for bad things doesn't mean that we stop doing the foundation and the building of that technology. There are many examples. Like we're today worried about deep fake. Now, what is the root of deep fake? It's actually not the GPT at all. By the way, some of us might think that it's GPT. The deep fake got invented by creating synthetic voice and synthetic faces, which is the media industry needed. You know, you, you can't have an Amitabh Bachchan dub all the time. So you wanted to have Amitabh Bachchan's voice available to others when he's sleeping, or maybe you wanted uh, Stephen Hawking's vo voice to be alive after he's gone. So those technologies which are built for actually doing movie production, dubbing and all of that, today somebody may misuse to do bad authentication and deep fake and all of that. So my fundamental point is that the, the development of technology is, is foundational for humanity's progress. But how it can get used uh, is a matter of how we, uh, in some ways, come together and control. So that's the first point which I want to make. 
Uh, the second point, which I will amplify, which I think has been done very well by uh, Dr. Rohini, but I will still uh, put it out there, is the, the some of these uh, principles are not universal. And, and I would say, forget about across uh, generation. Let's say, let me ask you a question. Like if somebody slaps one on one side of my cheek, what should be my responsible response? Now, I'm sure some of us might say that you put the other cheek aside, but that's not my responsible response. So, you know, there, there are various ways within the same context and connotation. So I think I'll go back to the point which Devjani made is that, you know, uh, before we start to have the responsibility attached to the developer, I think we need to also attach the responsibility to the humans which use those outcomes to the developer. I do want to make a point that in, the, uh, in general, we have been harsher to the developer community for them to be responsible for building a responsible system alone. And we are taking away the responsibility of the user community, which in my view is equally important, if not more, as to how do they apply. As Dr. Royani said that, you know, if you think ChatGPT is a search engine, I don't think that OpenAI is at fault. It's somebody who thinks or applies it that way. So those are my two key points. Yeah, and, and the companies and CEOs that you work with, are, are they thinking along? I mean, are they looking at the risks as well? Are they worried? Uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, CEO, you, you, you become a CEO when you are an optimist. Okay, so I will just put that category of people that uh, CEOs are generally optimists. They won't make CEOs if they were pessimists. So it's the, uh, so generally you will find that uh, the organization has uh, balancing responsibilities and there are people who would come and say, okay, let's use it in a very uh, responsible manner. I would say it also depends on the maturity of the organization. So I wouldn't generalize that all my clients are looking at the same way. But I think it's our endeavor, and I would say more than uh, it's KPMG, I think it's the uh, organization like NASCOM who are actually doing a great job in coming together and creating a more responsible usage and a more responsible development around it. So uh, I think there is a there is a there's a knowledge gap today which exists. Uh, there is uh, and which is what is all our endeavor. I think uh, I would also congratulate uh, you guys at Times Techies to taking this topic because I see many people who are actually either uh, superlatively happy with the uh, with the gpt models and i'll not say chat gpt by the way there's also uh, a, a, a dunning kruger model of chat gpt which basically says that the less you know about it the more confident you feel that you know about it so i think there's a bit of so people who are more evolved users i think are getting better so i congratulate you to take this topic for the wider audience to be aware of uh, and and using it responsibly okay uh, Professor, well, I, I mean, we, I know we all keep saying chat GPT, but a lot of a lot of other foundational large language models that are being built, I guess, is it, uh, which can be used for specific purposes and all that. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you should go back to even things like Mid Journey and uh, Dali. Those are the first generative models that were actually out there for public use, right? And those are mainly generating images. They're not large language models, but they still can do really creative uh, uh, image generation, right? And people have started using those for illustration. There are whole books that have been written that use only these like mid journey uh, for illustration like uh, and so these things so there are a lot of these tools not just for uh, text but also for uh, other kinds of generative things and of course uh, uh, like uh, it was initially mentioned right uh, the reason chat gpt has captured with imagination is they made the interface so simple just like google overtook all the other search engines not just because of course it was a better search engine back then but also they made the interface so simple right just the simple one text box that you type in so so a part of it is this whole human computer interaction piece, right? And from a researcher point of view, sitting in academia, then we can't really afford to license uh, chat GPT and things like that in bulk. Uh, there are also a lot of work that is happening in the open source community now. So many, many, uh, many of these large language models have come out and I believe that is also going to spur a whole new you know, dimension to the innovation that is happening. So people taking these open source models and then trying to come up with their own versions of chat GPT and, or, or whatever, right? so, uh, uh, whether it is uh, 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 the version from Meta or whether it is a version from Google or whatever. Right? So there are many of these that are coming out now. And uh, so we have to uh, be on the lookout. I mean, the technology is evolving at a, at a tremendous pace. Well, what's your advice to students in this? Should they, what, what, what are your students asking you? Uh, and what is your advice to them? 
So uh, well, students don't ask us anymore, right? They go to medium and read stuff. I mean, so <laughs> like, don't 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 even start me on that. But anyway, my advice is the following, right? So uh, ChatGPT or their real, so these kind of large generative models are here to stay. There's no wishing them away, right? It's not like I, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to do classical AI stuff, and this is a trend, this is a fashion that's going to go away. It is like saying that I will not do neural networks anymore, I'm not do deep learning anymore. At some point of time, deep learning will fade away and then other kinds of AI will take over. So uh, instead of trying to solve problems that uh, these large language models do well already, right? Now let's look at, uh, you know, buckle down, identify what are the problems that are there, right? What are the shortcomings? What are the things that they don't do well already? And then try to work on that space, right? Kind of move your research into that direction. And it is not as if uh, this is closed down all possible research in language mode. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done even here. So uh, there might be some amount of reorientation of research that needs to happen in the academic community as well, not just in the industry, uh, but still a lot of open problems out there. This is not like this is shut down. Uh, don't don't think that you know AI research is done. If, you know, so Jeth, if I can just add to what Professor Avindran said, or just maybe one different point, which is especially when we are talking about students, when we are talking about workforce. Um, I think we have to shift the narrative from just problems to actually advantages, the benefits, because these tools, if we know how to use them and we, and we stop thinking of them as humans or whatever, but we really think of it as augmentation tools, productivity tools, can significantly benefit. And not just that, but maybe Akhilesh can talk a bit about it, but going forward, um, these are gonna become necessary skills at the workplace. You know, I'll, I'll talk about NASCOM. We are primarily in the business of content and, you know, telling stories, you as media house, you are in the business of more than us, of creating content and telling stories, right? Now, if you know how to use these tools, these will become, these will create what we, you know, maybe call 10X journalists, as in 10X higher productivity. So say tomorrow you are in a world where um, half of your workforce have figured it out, have these skills and are 10x journalists and half have not figured it out for whatever reason, they do not want to get skilled. What are you going to do, right? We talk about AI taking jobs and I, I, the way I see it, AI is not gonna take or any technology is not gonna take the jobs. They're gonna create opportunities and then people with the right skills will displace those who don't have the right skills. So people will with AI jobs will take the will skills, will take the jobs of those who do not have the AI skills, right? So I think it's very important it's, it's, I honestly feel it's too early in the day for us to, at least when we are talking to students, when we are talking to workforce, to get bogged down by misuse and skills. Sure, we have to keep that perspective in mind, but the advantages and the benefits and the urgency is way more important to talk about. So just wanted to throw in that perspective. Yeah, in fact, uh, sorry if I'm jumping the gun, uh, Dr. Rainey, you had your hand up. But if there's one thing which I would uh, like to add from what Dave Johnny said is actually very good summarizing, is that uh, building the concept of trust. I think that is foundation for the businesses to use technology, for businesses to also request build of that technology, and for all of us as a community to trust the outcome generated by that. I think, and, and one may say, and I'm sure Professor will say that there's going to be a big gap between saying this is what I can trust and this is what it actually gets built. There's a, there are several steps between uh, trust being a design principle and trust being embedded into that one. But I think that to me uh, solves a lot of problem and a lot more predictable outcomes, which is what they're doing, saying that let thousand flowers bloom will actually create a higher degree of trust than otherwise. So to me, uh, ability to continuously uh, invest money in this development. By the way, it's not an easy development. It's a very expensive development. Continuing to doing that and also applying it to a wide range of test scenarios and getting the outcome, in my view, will be the right direction to go. Uh, I'm sorry for jumping in. <laughs> go ahead. No, no, no worries. So a couple of thoughts and building on what uh, Devjani said and also Akhilesh. Um, so yes, of course, the and we talked earlier about um, as trust and there are 
techniques coming up in terms of guardrails, in terms of a whole range of thinking that's happening in terms of being able to move in that direction. It's not a solved problem. But I want to go back to how to think about work. Um, it's, it's kind of important. You see, uh, you know, some, I think Einstein said that, that if he has given a problem, he'll spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes to think about solutions, right? I think it's, it's coming to a place when we think about outcomes. When you are thinking about, if I have a problem to solve, what is the outcome I'm going after? And you have this intelligent co-pilot to be able to help you get to those outcomes. Very often our mindset becomes, this is the outcome, but these are the steps I'm going to take. So you get very lost in the steps. Somebody said very interestingly, for example, in the coding world, right? Uh, people are saying that, you know, it's helping me stay in the zone. I'm trying to solve something and I'm not getting distracted by some subroutine I need to write or something I need to write, which is really not the outcome I'm going after. I'm able to stay in the zone. So that's one talking point. Second point I would say is there are people who are saying it's making me more creative. Uh, so what I would say is that the, I would challenge that creativity is probably getting more democratized. <laughs> so potentially more of us who thought we were techies can become creative, right? And the last point I would make is, I think we have to think about what are the frontier of problems you want to solve? Because there is this dichotomy, right? On the one hand, we are saying, okay, jobs. But on the other hand, we have really huge societal problems to address. So we have to change the frontier of what we can solve, whether it is targeted medical uh, delivery or targeted or you know personalized education, you name it, every sector. I think we have to think about the expanding the pie of problems that we can actually solve rather than saying this was my limited pie and now the machines are doing it. <laughs> I'll just stop with that. No, absolutely. I, I guess that's what a lot of people are talking about. There's so many newer opportunities to and solve some of the really big problems that we are faced with today. Uh, Dejani, I mean, I mean um, of course, this is the time when the world probably needed to be absolutely together. Uh, but this is exactly the time when, again, the world seems to be breaking into two, at least two big blocks. Uh, so, I mean, what what, sh what is your message? I mean, we have a few more minutes uh, from each of you. One, I mean, uh, some message to the government. What can, what should they be doing today? Should they be discussing this a lot more? And uh, I mean, we do seem to have some kind of a leverage with both blocks in some way. So, can we play an important role there? I think build the collective knowledge. This is where collaboration becomes so important. Academia, industry, government. None of us know enough today, and I think how do we? continue to have these conversations, good, bad, ugly, with disagreements, because the more we disagree, the more we learn. But creating that, and not just government, I think, you know, all of us, this is not something we should look at government to do, but they should definitely be part of these conversations, is grow that collective knowledge. Uh, while yes, there are bad actors in everything, we cannot make them the focus of the discussion. We cannot make misuse the key focus of the discussion. We absolutely should worry about it. But as Rohini said, the potential to do good is far, I think far outweighs the potential for harm, but or at least is as important as the potential for harm. And I think we have to focus on the potential to do good. And how do we leverage these technologies to really improve uh, human productivity, human longevity, et cetera, et cetera. While we have the design principles of inclusion, security, human alignment strongly in place. So I, I honestly think that the next few months, maybe years, have to be about a lot of open dialogues, a lot of open discussions. And if there is one thing we need to do, it is collectively learn and use that knowledge to figure out how to create the security framework around this. Akhilesh, you want to say something about what the government should be doing? Say one point that uh, as we start to build uh, regulation for responsible and inclusive uh, technology, we should also have the process to be very responsible and inclusive. 
So that would be my advice to the government. But on the other point, which uh, just tempted to uh, ex extend Devjani's point, uh, I think the uh, potential for good versus not so good, in my view, is one is to 100. There are 100 great things are going to happen with maybe one bad thing which will happen. Uh, and my thought is without sounding spiritual, but I think uh, if you as a humanity, if we as a humanity had the ability to build a nuclear reactor at a hundred dollar cost, because we have brought down the cost so much for everything, uh, I think we would have done it by now. So there is something which kind of folds us also saying, you know, uh, bad things can be used by bad people and in a very different way. So I think, and we still haven't figured out as to how did we come to this universe? So I think, uh, there are many, many questions which will remain unsolved till I die, but I think uh, how to regulate and do this AI, let's not jump to saying that we know all the answer and therefore ABC is the regulation. I think it must evolve. Okay, Rohini? Um, look, I think um, building on the uh, on, on Evjani and Akhilesh's points, so look, I think India has got a very interesting position. Uh, we have got from a, uh, from a skills perspective, the largest, if not one of the largest base of people who are AI skilled. Uh, we are also a very data rich company. We are becoming more and more, we are, you know, the whole digital uh, evolution that's happening in the country. I think it's a very important time for us being as diverse and democratic as we are to be that leader in this thinking. Uh, in this thinking on responsible AI, on all the discussion we had, I think it's a really important moment for us to be able to leading the thinking on it with innovation, but with the ability to make it work for India at our scale, at our diversity, with inclusion, with sustainability, all the challenges to make sure that we take that leadership. That's how I would really aspire uh, from for this moment from India. Hey. Professor? See, I'm muted. Ah. Yeah, I should also point out that none of the others are paid by the government. I am. So, uh, but um, <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, one of the things I have, I have to agree. So, uh, I, I mean, the uh, multiple uh, great points that were made. The first thing I would like to reiterate is that this has to be a much, much larger collaborative efforts. It can't be just coming from the government listening to you know a couple of people it has to be a much larger and national effort including academics and people from the industry right and when we're talking about lack of trust there's always a lack of trust between uh, indian academia and indian industry so all of that needs to be set aside there's too important an issue right now for us to you know try to stay in our silos and the second thing i would like to reiterate which has not quite been brought up yet is that Several things about responsible AI, right? Many of the principles and responsible AI have to be really grounded in a social and even potentially a cultural uh, background, right? So it really behoves that we don't adopt, you know, international standards for responsible AI deployment blindly and have to really work at building things that are very specific to India. And, uh, and the regulations that we are talking about, uh, you know, have to take care of the entire development pipeline. I think, uh, I think I'm not sure whether Rohini or Devjani mentioned this earlier, uh, talking about how responsibility needs to start from the moment you conceptualize a solution, not when you're coming and looking at in the deployment phase. And likewise, whatever uh, policies that we put in place have to really uh, talk about the entire pipeline and not just the, the final outcome. Okay, no, we're out of time. Uh, I know uh, we are entering this amazing new world, uh, enormous opportunities to use these technologies to solve some of our fundamental problems. But like all of you said, there are a lot of guardrails that we need to put in and it's uh, the beginning of a conversation. I'm glad um, NASCOM and Karaj as you uh, start this conversation. Um, and uh, we had a great discussion today, I'm sure there'll be a lot more such discussions required to get to where we ought to be. Uh, so hoping to have many more such discussions. Uh, thanks so much for a wonderful time. Last one hour, I myself learned a lot. Uh, so thanks, Devjani, Rohini, Professor Avindran, Akhilesh. Hope to have you again. Thanks, Sujit and Shilpa. You. you guys were the brave ones for taking this head on. So thank you for <laughs> that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.